Hi, I'm Philo and welcome to the show. Today I'm going to be talking about the Diabolical Mode Wipeout, and I'm joined by a very special guest, Crib. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Uh, Crib is a, a member of one of the few remaining active Australian Quake clans, I guess, 2G. Uh, they've competed, they actually came second in the recent Four Seasons Gaming Wipeout tournament, and I think probably in terms of d uh, game time, Crib is one of the most experienced Wipeout players in Australia so far. So uh, definitely authority in the Australian region. Uh, yes. Crib, what are your thoughts about the mode? My thoughts about the mode? Um, well, I've had some perspective in this uh, COVID-19 lockdown. I've played a lot of Clan Arena recently, and um, I always liken Clan Arena to Counter-Strike with uh, no bomb. But I feel like um, Wipeout kind of gets over the hurdles that Clan Arena had. It uh, allows you to be aggressive, it allows you to use a bit of utility, it allows you to actually really have a common... Uh, goal with your teammates as opposed to just holding a room so I love it personally but uh, I definitely think it needs improvements as well all right that's interesting so when you say about holding a room because um, you, you know in clan arena just I guess that threat of death means that pushing out is always that big risk in wipeout you have much more of an ebb and flow mm. right it's more kind of like it comes in cycles uh, cycles of aggression cycles of hiding and being more defensive uh, what improvements do you think there could be Whilst I definitely think um, Diabolical didn't have as much emphasis on Defender's Advantage that Quake Live has and maybe Quake Champions has, um, I definitely thought that you could still get away with being defensive or running away or not having um, map initiative. So... Yeah, that's yeah. definitely yeah my biggest concern with the mode, especially in public games. I found you could just run away for ages. Like it was really hard when you didn't have an organized team to close out a round to get that like organized aggression you needed to close it yeah. out. So I think the main thing that I've been talking about is the addition of power ups, and I happen to have remembered what power ups they were thinking of doing, but effectively they're just soft power ups. So it's not like quad damage or um, battle suit or anything like crazy, but. Um, yeah, I know they've been talking about that. Nice. That's really interesting, yeah. And because once you're, you know, planning around time and stuff, like, I think there's a lot of room to, oh, I've got to fight now so that either we're strong or we've died and respawned ready for a power-up, or, yeah, that, that would be a cool extra element to kind of go with the, like, ebbs and flows. Yeah, my understanding is it's going to be stuff like a power-up that gives all your pincer shots for the rest of that round, making so that they're 80 damage. So... I mean, that's one example. Another example would be maybe you start each life with an extra 50 armor. Um, so what it means is, let, let's say you're in the round and, and the, the 80 pincer damage power-up comes up at one minute, you, you know, you have to be there. Or you have to at least try to contest it or steal it. Um, otherwise, you'll be at a, a greater disadvantage. And if you do steal it, then, you know, you might die, but you'll still have those remaining lives within that round, starting with the best pincer. As far as, like, competitive stuff goes, like you said, it's got a bit more meat to it than Clan Arena. Mm -hmm. um, do you see this being, like, top-tier competitive? Like, would you see, you know, Cypher and Avic and some of the big names of Quake? Do you think they could bring really interesting play to it? I guess maybe what you might see is you actually might see those players not be as dominant, because I think they're kind of better at... Um, map control and item control as opposed to like raw aim so i feel like you might see a different class of player that might be more dominant mm. the pe the people who are maybe like where Razy was at the start of quake champions yeah or, or people like claws or those people mm. um which would be great like i feel like that stuff is good for quake and good for an arena fps you know uh, other play styles can prevail yeah definitely and, and anything to just shake up the names at the top is, is always really exciting <laughs> Uh, it's only been like 15 years, right? Yeah, exactly. I'm a little bit tired of seeing Rafa win everything, honestly. <laughs> it, one interesting thing when it comes to like the top players is that they tend to be experts at like avoiding taking damage while dealing max damage in return, and that seems to be something that's pretty important in Wipeout. So uh, I definitely wouldn't no, rule them out. Yeah, you're you right. know? <laughs> definitely can't rule them out. Um, when it comes to like you know the team aspects and the individual aspects, you know how do you approach the game as an individual? Like if you're in a pub game, what are your goals moment to moment? Is it just hit your rails, keep your distance until you know you've got the frags? Like what what's going through your mind? Uh, for the most part, yeah, I think I play pretty defensively. <laughs> I, I think I, I generally avoid a lot of damage at, at at times and just try and do as much damage as possible. Especially in casual play, I mean, there's so much random stuff that can go on. 
I mean, competitive plays a little bit differently, but um, maybe, I, maybe I just bait my teammates for the most part in casual play and get as much damage as possible. Yeah. No, I mean, that's that's the classic kind of clan arena style as well. <laughs> and just, yeah, like good quake intuition, good quake fundamentals. Mm. Uh, it all works out. I guess then, yeah, from a more competitive point of view, as I said, the Four Seasons Gaming Jewel, uh, Four Seasons Gaming Wipeout yeah. Tournament, even, you guys came second. Uh, you beat Team, Phrase, Camera, Python, Fears. Definitely no small feat. What kind of changes, what are you doing with your team to, you know, especially to beat a top level team? Um, first of all, I think that we had the most experience um, out of all the players, really. Um, I think Dan, Steege, and us four had played the game the most, um, so that counted for a lot. I think we generally learned from... I think we had about 20 scrims that week, <laughs> so we played a lot, a lot, a Damn. lot. Um, and, like, Wipeout games aren't short. No, we were playing every evening of that week, because we were loving the game, to be honest. Um, it's quite addictive, I mean, how we approached it was, mm. I, I think, what a lot of teams are adopting. It's it's knowing when to die. It's knowing when to kind of be overly aggressive to kind of die and then effectively get a more advantageous respawn that would help your team out. So, mm. it's, I think a lot of the a lot of the success of the team comes from having that intuition, knowing when to die and when to survive. And I feel like that's just what we mastered over our um, Frozen Games team for the most part. I mean, we tried to come up with map strategies. So, like, originally we had a few maps that were like, okay, we're going to hold here or, like, we're going to put one person here or something like that. But um, it got... It actually became a little bit uh, inflexible in adopting that. And that's what I reckon we found in Quake Live CTF is... We became eventually a little bit too rigid in our team position, and sometimes you need to have like someone who kind of roams, so to speak, as opposed to just hard holding a position. One thing we did try to do was we generally tried to always um, position the person who's spawned with a knockback weeble <laughs> next to like the void as much as possible. So we actually kind of like had positions in that sense. That's cool. So we always tried to like get as many void kills as possible. And mm. we generally tried to, um, because because I think the default stance in all of these games is just go top, is just go top, go top, go top. So generally we tried to like pick at top from multiple different angles. I think that was the most part. And then call if people split up or if we could kind of hound down one individual. That was probably our strategy overall. I don't think there was much more nuance beyond that. No, that that's really good. I, I like it, especially yeah, knowing when to die and picking those strategic times so that you're like syncing up well with the rest of your team or like considering when their guys are coming mm. up. Yeah, I, I think there'll be a lot of depth in that. Do you think that'll be interesting from a spectator point of view? I guess that's something I'm worried about, right? Like, I think I could commentate it and make it sound exciting, but do you think spectators will be able to grasp that very well? Um, I think definitely that's where 3v3 will help. I think 4v4 is notoriously potentially harder to cast than spectate. I think I was watching back the VODs uh, on 4SG and um, I think it was very hard for Mick to actually kind of be on the right person at the right time. So, yeah, I think it will be challenging. I think maybe it's, it's knowing who to follow and when. I think it's almost worth having like an automatic follow like most stats for example. <laughs> that would be a really good quality of life, yeah. Yeah, because I think the person who just respawns is generally the playmaker in the next minute. So, like, that's kind of, like, my tip for, like, what to do. At the, at the very least, there need to be some more observer tools so that people can get, like, really nerdy about where to work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you just have to be following the right person. If you're following the right person, you know, I think that's where the finesse comes in. That's where the challenge comes in for the caster. Because mm. um, you might miss something for example. <laughs> yeah. It, the action does seem to really be like, you know, it, like one action point at any given time, which yeah. is good. Uh, and like, I guess something like Quake Live TDM, there's so much happening around the map at all times. It's That's like kind of why that's so hard to cast and follow. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a big pitfall of TDM. There's like too many things to control. 
Uh, whereas I think in Wipeout, you're just kind of generally getting initiative, you're generally getting that spawn advantage, and then you're kind of uh, working as a team to conservatively, conservatively force their spawn to keep getting longer and longer. And like overcomes who are according like you know grinding the enemy down like just constantly playing our advantage and just like picking an enemy off regrouping picking an enemy off and like you kind of can start to sense that you're getting a time advantage and mm-hmm. so I think that's like just the objective that you need to kind of do and I think that's you know much less of a challenge for the caster I like to think but who knows and I think I think you know power up spawning every odd minute will kind of give it, you know again something additionally to focus on. Yeah, it gives it, like, really clear kind of goalposts to funnel everything through. Yeah, so I'm optimistic. Yeah, well, because I, I wasn't commentating the uh, Four Seasons Gaming Tournament. I haven't commentated Wipeout yet. So, yeah, I, th- I think, you know, uh, I'll have to see how high I can push the caster skill ceiling along with the player skill ceiling. <laughs> but at risk of this going too far down the caster yeah. conversation. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I actually feel like that's pretty much a good rundown of, of your thoughts on it. Uh, is there anything else you think we we should say in this in this uh, conversation? No, I think that's pretty much it. I think I think I really think the power ups will mitigate a lot of the the issues around hiding and, and playing a little bit too defensive. Um, and yeah, I think we'll just wait and see. I, I think I have faith in the dev team. I think for the most part, from what I've heard, I've I've spoken to Doc uh, Mr H or Hersiach in mm. Quake Live recently. You know, he was really saying that they really think that they've struck a winner with Wipeout. Um, So, like, I'm certainly quite optimistic, especially with the power-offs being added. Um, I think maybe the other modes is what we have to be kind of mindful of Mm. for the most part. So it's a good problem to have. Yeah, I I would definitely mimic what you said in that, yeah, I just have confidence in the devs to come up with something awesome. Um, Do you have anyone you want to shout out while while you're here? Uh, not really, just my uh, 2G clan, been uh, going strong since 2008. That's awesome. And uh, one more thing, what are you playing while you're waiting for Diabolico to come back? Yeah, I'm playing a uh, pretty competitive Age of Empires 2, uh, Definitive Edition, very fun. Uh, another boomer game to add to the list. And <laughs> uh, what else am I playing? That's about it, I'm playing a bit of Doom Eternal just to kind of... K- keep shooting things and also quake live just to keep on the ball yeah because you never really stop with quake live no one ever really leaves yeah well i want to leave yeah i'd love to say goodbye but whatever yeah <laughs> a few more weeks a few more weeks all right awesome well that's really fantastic thank you so much uh hopefully everyone watching's learned a thing or two about wipeout and is gonna get just ex- as excited as we are about the mode all right cheers guys <laughs>